Hey, good morning. Everybody doing okay? Welcome to Cumberland Homestead Baptist Church. Uh, today we're here to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. I'm glad you are here. I know there's a lot of sick folks. Uh, I believe uh, Brother Michael's sick, Miss Michelle's sick, Miss Misty's sick, Brother Kenny had the flu this week, and um, that's just the ones that I'm aware of, and I know there's a lot more. And so let's be in prayer for one another, those who are sick, um, especially. If this is your first time visiting with us, we want you to feel welcome, and in our bulletin, you'll notice on the side, there's a perforated section here. We ask all of our first-time guests just to fill that out, stick that in the offering plate, so that we can have a record of your visit. Uh, but today is uh, Resurrection Celebration Day. So um, in the Old Testament, the Sabbath was Saturday. In the New Testament, it seems that it changed over uh, to uh, Sunday. And at this church, we were particularly Sabbatary, where we um, just take the Old Testament and bring it over. But we believe that Sunday is the Lord's Day. And so you have to gather uh, for worship on Sunday to celebrate the Resurrection of Christ. And uh, today is the Lord's Day. And so we're here to, just by being here, friends, we're proclaiming that he's alive and that he's returning soon. Uh, brief announcements, friends. Uh, True Hope Helping Hands ministry met yesterday. We were able to serve 62 adults uh, that represented 187 people in their homes. And so it's our ministry to young families. People come in and we talk with them about Jesus and we pray with them and then we give them you know, supplies to help, like diapers and and toiletries and things like that to help with their families. And so many of you have donated towards that ministry. We want to thank you for that. And um, we always have opportunities to serve in that. If you have any questions, you can see us going to Brooks about that. And then you'll notice as well that we're working on an in-house directory. And so if you are a member or a consistent visitor, uh, we would like uh, your picture and your information so that we can put you in this pictorial directory that we're doing. And you'll see information there in your bulletin. Please get that to Missy just as soon as you can because we're going to be trying to print that very soon, probably the end of this month, getting the first uh, print of that out. And so please uh, be aware of that. And then you'll notice as well that the youth are, are looking for volunteers uh, on Sunday evenings for uh, meals. If you'd like to cook a meal for the youth, uh, they gather and eat and fellowship and they have Bible study on Sunday evenings. And so I want to encourage you, if you have any questions about that, you can see Brother Michael. I'm sure Brother Zach can help you as well. And then I uh, remember this Thursday is Young at Heart at noon, February 14th. What is the meal this week, Miss Carrie? Oh, y'all are going to love this. It's Valentine's Day, and we're having a special. We're having that pork tenderloin. They y'all love that. And we're having a special for Tin bacon. That's it. That's good. That is good. Who doesn't want like that, right? Um, <laughs> we have an open gym as well, February 22nd, 6 to 9 p.m. Uh, for if you'd like to help, or I mean, if you'd like to bring your children and have a date night, uh, you're more than welcome to do that. Any other announcements? Anything I might have forgotten about that? All right, well, let's prepare our hearts for worship. And uh, let's remind ourselves as we approach the Lord or while we're here, you know, it's, we, we actually believe that when man, so God gave us his law, we couldn't save ourselves, we could not work our way to heaven, and when we could not, God sent his son to do the work for us. And that's the good news, that Jesus has literally fulfilled every command that God required of you, and then died as if he broke every one of them. So that the true lawbreakers, you and me, could be placed in Christ spiritually one day, eternally, in the new heavens and new earth. And if that doesn't get you fired up, I, I realize we have a tendency to think we need to learn something new to get fired up. But the truth is, we need to remember something very old. Something you were taught in BBS. That Jesus came to die for sinners and save them eternally. Would you bow with me? Father, I thank you for this morning, the opportunity to worship you with my brothers and sisters. It's amazing that you have saved us. It's amazing that you brought us together. 
And so, Lord, may we stand up and sing like the redeemed. May we sing like those who have been placed in Christ by the Holy Spirit. May we enjoy salvation. May we desire to live for you while knowing that it is only by your grace that we're saved forevermore. May you be exalted in Christ's name. Amen. Church, let's stand and encourage one another in the name of Jesus here today.
in, standing on the mat. So let's all stand together. We'll sing the first, second, fifth.
raise the screen uh, for a second, please. You sit down. If I can, I would have been riding a horse for two days. I don't know if I can or not. <laughs> Chasing my bird dog around for two days on a horse. My horse? Yeah, my horse. You don't own a horse, Richard? Well, we're talking about, let's talk about something else. We'll talk about that in a minute. I shouldn't have started that. <laughs> that's, that's my own fault right there. Well, a pony's just a, it's just a horse that been in the water and shrunk up. <laughs>
You know, you always, you always just about to get that right. And how did he show that great love for us? Anybody know? What did he do? Um, I bet you do know, Richard. Tell me one more time. Died on the cross. He died on the cross for us, okay? What greater love? And you know how we can be reminded of that these days? Anytime we see a cross, okay, we're reminded that Jesus died on the cross for us. <laughs> But you, and that could, that could be sad, couldn't it? But well, what's happy about that? And three days later, three days later, he'll come back to life. Three days later, he came back to life. That's the happy part, okay? So we can be happy, we can rejoice, and know when we see that cross that Jesus loves. Yeah, tell me something, Richard. Well, three days later, um, Jesus came back to life because he's a God. That's right. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for the love that you have for us and the love we have for each other. We thank you for, Lord, just giving us that reminder. But we most of all thank you for Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.
this. And thank you for your testimony. Um, you know, no one has loved us like Jesus has. Um, you know, the fall of Adam left us uh, bruised and broken uh, in sin. And then the law of God came along and crushed us even further because it showed us God's standard and our inability to keep it. And so when I was broken by the fall and I was crushed by the law, Jesus came and saved me. And uh, there's, there's great freedom in Christ. And we're going to talk about that freedom today. And, uh, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 3, verse 19 through 25. And the... Uh, the question I'm answering today is, is the law of God binding for Christians? So is the law of God, is the Old Testament still binding for Christians today? And the short answer is yes. Um, the short answer is yes, but this is a difficult question to answer. Because it is binding to us in a way it was not for Adam. In a way it was not concerning Old Testament believers and so we're going to discuss that today. We're going to let uh, the Apostle Paul teach us from Galatians chapter 3, uh, verse 19 through 25. And what I want to encourage you today, and what I want to really come against today, is this assumption. And it's, it's amazing how prevalent it is, but in many churches, especially in children's ministries, there's this emphasis on morality to the point uh, where it undermines the gospel. It undermines... So we, we've got to really ask ourselves the question, do we want to raise Christians or do we want to raise Pharisees? Um, because if you start, if you're teaching the Bible to children as if they can accomplish it, if you're just trying to raise little, little moral people, um, you're, going to raise, you're going to get exactly what you desire. You're, you're going to raise little moral people. And what we're trying to raise is Christians, Christians who realize not that they are moral, but that they are immoral. That they're in need of a Savior. And the law of God is not something, when we teach the law of God, when we teach any command in the Bible, we must teach it as if Jesus has come and died for the disobedience to that command. As if our, as if our relationship with God is only okay because of Christ paying for our sins. Not because of the morality that we have accomplished. And so, the danger in teaching the law is that you teach it as if it's a checklist. So you think of the Ten Commandments, you think of loving God and loving your neighbor, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, loving your neighbor as yourself. Seeing that as a checklist that you get to accomplish. And the reality is that, friend, if you could accomplish that, why do you need Jesus? You know? And the whole point of the Bible is that you could not accomplish the commands of God. That you were broken by the fall. You were dead in your sin. God's standard cannot change because He is holy and the law of God is a reflection of God's character. It reveals the holiness of God. So when we talk about sinning, we talk about sinning against God. We're not talking about really sinning against the law as if the law is somehow outside of God. You know, it's this standard that God created. Um, but the reality is, is that that law, the commands of God are a reflection of God's identity. So to break God's commands is to sin against God himself. And so we need reconciliation with God. And uh, as I was studying this, I was reminded of a uh, testimony from a brother in Christ named Mez McConnell. And uh, he's over a 20 schemes ministry. They, uh, he's basically a missionary. He leads a mission Organization where they're, they're trying to reach um, very, very impoverished people in Scotland, in kind of the slums of, of Scotland. And um, it's interesting, his testimony, he was converted, he was saved by reading the book of Romans. Um, he, see, he was raised by an abusive stepmother, and some horrendous abuse went on in his relationship with her. And as, as he got older, these various counselors that basically saved him from this abuse were telling him that he was really a good person. You know, you're, you're really a good person, just bad things have happened to you. And, um, and he said, I knew that I was not a good person. And so he read the book of Romans, and the, you see the first three chapters of Romans basically say that we're dead in our sins. 
If you've ever read the first three chapters, especially chapter three, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none who seeketh after God. I mean, it, it just it just really lays you, lays you bare before God in your sinful condition. But then it tells the good news of how Christ came to save us. And it really is a beautiful book. But he was saved as he read that because it told him the truth about himself and told him that the goodness that he needed was not in the mirror, but in Christ. And so when the, we are broken by the fall, we are crushed by the law, but we are resurrected by Christ. And so you will not find, I realize society wants you to look in the mirror, and that's where you find your hope, that's where you find your identity. The Bible says the opposite of that. You look to Jesus. You look to Christ. He, if you're a Christian, He is your identity now. And that's who you're running towards. That's who you're pursuing. And so is the law of God still binding for Christians? Galatians 3, 19 through 25. God's Word says, I, I tell you what, I'll start in verse 15 and then we'll read to 25. Um, to give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It, it does not say into offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions. Until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and it was put in place through angels by a mediator. Now, a mediator implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the Scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Let's pray to you. Father, my prayer is that you open up our eyes to your truth, that we might enjoy grace afresh and anew today, and that we would see your law as something that is good and beneficial, but something that neither condemns us nor saves us. For only Christ alone saves, and all our condemnation has been endured by him. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing I want you to see, so there's only two points, friends. The law of Moses was given, verse 19 and 20, to show us our sin. To show us our sin. You see this in verse 19. He says, why the law? So of salvation, now earlier in this chapter, the Apostle Paul argued that salvation has always been by God's grace. And that's what we just read in Galatians 3, uh, 15 through 18. But the purpose of the law was given because of transgression. It was because of sin. The law of Moses did not add anything to justification through grace. You know, being declared righteous through grace. But it shows man, man's inability to please God and our need for the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. The coming of the seed of Abraham, Jesus Christ. You know, God told Abraham that through his seed all nations would be blessed. And uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't Isaac, it was Jesus, the ultimate fulfillment of that promise. And so it was because of transgression, so the law served to reveal our sin to us and point us to a Savior. The law was never meant to send us running to the mirror so that we could pat ourselves on the back, brag about ourselves about how self-righteous and good we are. It was actually to condemn us. It was actually to show us of our need for a coming Savior. And so in other words, God has been very gracious in showing us these standards and giving us these standards so that He would show us we could not meet what He required. And so it was until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. So until the Son of God was born until Jesus Christ came, the law of Moses was to reign. And so the law points us to only what grace can produce. Again, the law is not a checklist. The Ten Commandments are not a checklist. 
Now, it is something that you should pursue, and we'll get to that here in a moment. But if you could fulfill the law, there would be no need for Jesus. If you could be good enough for salvation, if you could please God, there would be no need for Jesus. So we all stand, we all sit here today condemned by the law. Because we have broken the law, we have sinned against God, we've got an issue. Even if from this day forward you, you can live a sinless life, you still have sins in your life that must be atoned for. And no amount of self-righteousness can atone for the sins that you've committed. You need someone who is perfectly righteous, who's never sinned, to atone for your sin. Or you're not going to be saved. And so there seems to be this assumption in today that if my good outweighs my bad when I die, that God will let me into heaven. The problem is, is that one sin outweighs all your righteousness. It outweighs every bit of it. And so we are condemned. We are guilty before God. Until we enjoy the finished work of Christ. And he also makes an interesting statement here. And it's easy to miss. Notice this in verse 19 there. Until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels. By mediator. And so this is a reference to Deuteronomy 33 2. This is what the Bible says. It says, The Lord uh, came from Sinai and dawned from Seir upon us. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the ten thousands of holy ones with flaming fire at his hand. Now, holy ones, there is a reference uh, to angels. And it seems that the angels were evidently involved in the giving of God's Old Testament law to Moses. The deacon Stephen said in Acts 7.53, You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. And so he also argues that the law was given through angels. So it seems that the law was ordained by God, given to Moses, uh, to give to the people of Israel. And in the first part of Deuteronomy 5.5, 5, Moses wrote, While I stood between the Lord and you at home to declare to you the word of the Lord. And so you have these... These folks involved, I say folks, I don't know if you call angels folks, um, but you have angels and Moses involved in the giving of the law. And it goes on in verse 20, it says, Now a mediator implies more than one, or an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. And uh, th this verse is difficult to interpret, uh, but there's no need for a mediator when there's only one party in the covenant. So the law of Moses had several parties involved, so there need to be mediators between God and Israel. But notice he says, but God is one. And so follow me here. There's a mediator needed as God gave his law to humanity through Moses. And in the covenant of the law of Moses, there were mediators, angels and Moses, and there were two parties involved, God and Israel. And so with the Mosaic law came stipulations on Israel's obedience. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, Deuteronomy 5.33 You shall walk in all the way that the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live, and that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land that you shall possess. And so the problem was that Israel kept falling short of God's glory because of her sinfulness. And the reality is, is a promise, a covenant, is only as good as the parties who are involved. And so in this case, one party, sinful Israel, could not keep their end of the covenant because of sin. On the other hand, salvation through the promise or grace was given to Abraham without a mediator. So God was the only party involved in the promise to Abraham. Y'all remember that promise? God, God brought Abraham, told him to basically make a Chaldean covenant. He told him to bring animals, cut them in half, and lay them to the side there. And, you know... In the Chaldean covenant, you and the other party would walk through those animals and say, if I break my covenant, then may what happened to these animals happen to me. And so when it came time for God and Abraham to walk through these animals, God caused a deep sleep to go over Abraham. And go read in your Old Testament. It's very fascinating because it says that God appeared as a, I think it's a smoking oven, if I'm not mistaken. And God passes through those animals himself because it's God's covenant to keep. 
And for that, that's one reason why we as Southern Baptists believe that once you're saved, you're always saved. Because this is God's covenant to keep. It's not our covenant to keep. It's God's. It's God's. It's based on God's promises to us. When people talk about, well, how do you believe? Do you believe that you can get saved and just live however you want to? No, the ones that God saves, he, he also changes. He gives them the Holy Spirit. He resurrects them. Gives them a new, <coughs> new life in Christ. And, um, you know, I don't believe you can just live however you want to because you're not who you used to be. You've been transformed by God, the Holy Spirit. You're literally the temple of the living God now. And so, I believe God will fulfill His promises. You know, uh, Jesus said that he, would give the, he was giving the Holy Spirit as a gift to dwell with you forever. There's nobody in hell who has the Holy Spirit in their hearts, friends. But everybody in heaven does. And every Christian does. On earth. And so God was the only part involved in the promise to Abraham. It was his promise to keep. He made the covenant to drive the people to the promise. And so this reality, the law of Moses was first given to show us our sin. So if, you're, if you understand that salvation is about God's grace, you may be thinking, well, why the law? Well, the law sends us running to Jesus. So we were crushed by the fall, bruised, or maybe some bruised by the fall, crushed by the law. Um, but it sends us running to someone who can save us. The second thing I want you to see, and that's the second point, is actually it sends us running to Jesus in verse 21. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. See, the reason why God's commands could not give life, God said to do X, Y, or Z, and we couldn't do it, it was because we were, sin were sinners. We literally cannot do it. If you're, if you're here and you're an unbeliever, and you just think what I'm preaching is below me, I want to ask you, can you stop sinning? Can you stop even thinking sinful thoughts? And if you can't, how do you explain that according to your worldview? It's very strange for someone to say, well, I, I don't believe in objective good or evil, and then to say, and then they still think objective, they still think of evil things in their heads. Where does that come from? It just doesn't make any, it, it doesn't fit. It doesn't make any sense. Unless, from a Christian worldview, that you're a sinner, you're broken. You need mending, you need healing. And only Christ can provide it. I mean, he, he literally will come and take up residence in your heart and rule you for all eternity. And as a matter of fact, you'll be more free than you've ever been. <laughs> because it's amazing. Where sin used to rule in my heart, Christ does now. And he'll do the same for you. He'll do the same for you. And so the law of God is not contrary to the promises of God. God God's law was never against God or His purposes. God justified Abraham by His grace. The Bible talks about how Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him or credited to him as righteousness. And so Abraham was saved by grace through faith in Yahweh's promise. Or the fact that he would fulfill his promise. And so we trust in Yahweh's promise too. Jesus Christ. The law of Moses was given to prepare the way for the seed of Abraham. And he says, for if the law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. And so, you know, if, there, if God could have saved us uh, by sheer command, do this, don't do that then I'm sure he would have given that law instead of coming himself to fulfill it. Because of the state of mankind and sinfulness, there was no moral standard God could give sinners to complete and us still be righteous. God either had to give an unrighteous, less than perfect law, you know, that allowed for sin. You know, I mean, God could have said, hey, well, he could have said, but that's the only law we could fulfill if God just said, try your best, you know, that would have been the law. Just, just try your best. Try your best, husbands, to love your wives as Christ loved the church. Try your best, wives, to submit to your husbands as sons of the Lord. 
But no, they're, 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 that's not what it says. It says, husbands, love your wives. It's not optional. It's like you, you have to do this. Wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. It's, the, there's, there's, there's just, it's not like do your best. The reality is, is that even the law that is in the New Testament, we're not just talking about the Old Testament, any command that's in the Bible is law. Any of those commands, regardless if they're in the Old or New Testament, shows you that you need Jesus. You, we fall short of all of them, friend. I mean, how many of us would stand up and testify, oh, I have loved the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, and mind this morning, and I have loved my neighbor as myself perfectly today. It would be very difficult to stand and to testify to that reality today. And it's only been a few hours, you know, you know, just a few hours. The reality is, friend, in Christ, we have loved our neighbors and God perfectly today. But apart from Him, we're in trouble. And so the law should serve as this tutor to bring us to Christ, to show us our need for someone else, someone beyond the law, someone who is outside of us, who can save us. And live, literally be obedient to law, but then die the death that we deserve. I mean, verse 22 says, The Scriptures imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, understand what he's saying here. He's saying every godly example you have in the Old Testament, the law imprisoned them under sin. He's saying literally no one has ever been saved by their good works. Is what he's saying. No one. Not Abraham. Not Noah. Not Moses. No. Go back and read your Old Testament and list out those guys' righteous deeds and list out their unrighteous deeds. And you'll see that they need Jesus. That they need a Savior. It all sends us running to Christ to save us. And these men were tops and shadows to show us of someone greater. In verse 23, it says, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So before faith came, the law was to keep us restrained from evil, ultimately sending us running to Jesus Christ to be relieved from the guilt of our sin. And so it's like the law puts us in this prison of disobedience. The law demands perfection. I mean, the law demands perfection. Again, the command is not just do your best. Just try your hardest. And often when I talk to folks who believe you can lose your salvation, this is kind of the language that they bring. Well, if you just do your best, if you try your hardest, it's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you must be Holy. God says, be holy for I am holy. I am holy. I mean, if our good works are involved in our salvation, I think all of us are in trouble. Because we've fallen short. But Jesus hasn't. And friend, if you're in Him, if you'll trust in Him, it's not only Him dying and saving you, for the sins you've committed. Literally the righteousness that he has accomplished. Becomes yours as well. And so it is the righteousness of Christ. Credited to our accounts. So those 33 and a half years. And still the life that Christ is living today. You're treated as if you have lived that life. Just like on the cross. He was treated like he lived your life. It's very free. Not free to pursue sin, but free to enjoy God's grace in Christ. Verse 24, so then the law was our guardian or our teacher until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. And so the law of Moses was to send us running to Jesus. And so when we're teaching our children, and I want my children to grow up and be moral children, moral people. But the, the danger is that they start seeing the law as a checklist, right? They start seeing the commands of daddy and mommy as a checklist. Oh, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that. I'm, I'm a good little boy, I'm a good little girl. 
But the Bible condemns every one of us under sin. And parents, we, we've got to remind our children. We've got to view it as us shepherding our children to where we are sending them running to Jesus. And so, you know, remind them. So when you punish them, remind them that they disobeyed, they're going to be punished, but that God is gracious. And if they'll trust in Jesus, He will save them eternally. And there's a great reminder of that reality. And not only that, but your children need to see you repent. They see you sin. <laughs> okay. They need to see you repent. If, you have, if you're raising your children, your children have never heard you apologize to them, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. And the reason why I say that, because you and I, we are in need of Jesus too. Our children already know that, and we proclaim that reality. And so when we do things, or when we um, have unrighteous anger, we need to own up to it and seek the forgiveness of our, not only our spouses, but our children. Because they all know we need Jesus too. And they know that we fall short. And so let's own up to that and enjoy the grace of God together. And so the purpose was to be justified by faith in verse 25. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So he makes this statement that we are no longer under this teacher of the law. And so remember, the law was to send us running to Jesus. And so the temptation is to say, well, now that Jesus is here, we don't, have to, we don't even have to follow the law anymore. Um, but that's not what he's saying. He's saying we do not look to the law for our righteousness. We look to Jesus. He's saying we're no longer justified by the law. We've never been justified by the law, but he's saying we don't seek it in the law, and we don't, um, we're no longer condemned by the law. Because we are in Christ. And so how is the law useful today? And I'll conclude. Well, first, the law is a law for humanity, not merely Israel or the church. I, so I believe this book, all right, this book is a book for humanity. It's not just a book for the church. If you want to know how to flourish in, in God's creation, you've got to follow this book. And the further you get from this book, the more destruction you're going to bring to your society. The further America gets from this book, the more destruction they're going to bring to themselves and society. Amen. It's just a fact. That's how God has designed His creation. So if God puts up an ideal of marriage, the further you get from that ideal, one man, one woman, coming in together for life, the further you get from that, the more destruction you bring to your society. And it's not just that. Parenting, every definition of morality that's contained in Scripture, it is a self-imposed destruction. And I mean, our, our country was at the very least, I realized there were deists who signed our Constitution, Declaration of Independence as well. Um, but the morality that is contained in Scripture was the basis for the founding of this country. At the very least. And so the law is a law for humanity, not merely Israel, the church. R.C. Sproul, this is what he said. He said, the Reformation was founded on grace and upon law. Yet the law of God was not repudiated by the Reformers. John Calvin, for example, wrote what has become known as the threefold use of the law. Now, this is where I believe that the law is applicable to us. The first purpose of the law, so any command in Scripture, is to be a mirror. And so it reflects God's perfect righteousness to us. It shows us God's standard. And it reminds us how much we need Jesus. Right? I, I don't know about you, but I need to be reminded constantly that it's by grace I'm saved. Not my good works. Because when you sin, if you believe you're saved by grace, you're no more deserving. You're no more deserving of heaven when you're obedient than when you sin as a believer. Because it's by grace. The entire time that you're a Christian. It's by grace from beginning to end. You said, Brother Jared, so when I sin, should I confess it? Of course, but you're confessing to your father. 
You're not confessing to someone where you hope he's going to adopt you. You're not in an orphanage of, with unbelievers anymore trying to get adopted by God. you got to understand, friend, that when God saved us, He looked upon the orphanage of the world, people were abandoned by their father, the devil, and He freely chose to adopt them into His kingdom. And all those who repent and believe are brought into the kingdom of God for all eternity. And you've got to understand the way that the Bible describes Christians as being the sons and daughters of God, the body of Christ, being in Christ. We've got to understand that in order to get out of that kingdom, you would have to, it would be like unadopting us. <laughs> it would be God unadopting his children. It would be God kicking them out of his house. It would be, I mean, all these horrible realities. And that is not what God has said that he would do for those who trust in Jesus. And so the, the first purpose of the law tells us about who God is. The second purpose is the restraint of evil. You know, the, the law, the commands of God restrain evil in our hearts. I mean, think about what if there were none of these commands? What if the, God had not revealed to us his inerrant word. What if these commands were not here? I mean, think about how your life would be different. Think of how it restrains sin. Not only, not only in the church, but also in the world. The third purpose of the law is to reveal what is pleasing to God. And so I want to leave you with this to think through. To think through this third purpose concerning Christians. It shows us what is pleasing to God. And so when you read the commands of God, you pursue them. You pursue, as a Christian, you should, you should want to please God. All right? So when you try to do what the Bible says, okay, you, you should try to do what the Bible says. Okay? But when you fail, when you fail, you're not lost. But you are a potential disobedient child. And so you confess that sin to God and you get up and seek to live for Him again. And you're reminded of the reality. So I'm constantly, I'm constantly looking to Jesus. Now he, the Bible talks about Him being the author and the finisher of my faith. I, I believe He's going to finish what He started in me. Now, if I started it, I'd be in trouble. Because I might not finish it. But what he has started in me, I believe he will bring to completion. He will finish what he started. And so I found the Westminster Larger Catechism. I realize that's, that might be foreign uh, to us. But um, this is what it says. I, I found it very helpful. And the point is that we are in Christ. We're not in the law. We're in Jesus, not in the commands of God. The law helps to show us three things. How much we are bound to Christ for His fulfilling the law. So when I read the commands of God and I think, you know, I'm not that. I, I pursue that, but I fall short of that. It reminds me of what Jesus has done for me. And how I've got to cling closely to Him. The second thing is that the law provokes us to more thankfulness. You know, the standards of God, love the Lord your God. So Jesus summarized it in Matthew 22, 37 through 39. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourselves. That's a summary of the whole law. So those two commands, as I read that, it reminds me that Jesus has fulfilled that perfectly. I have not fulfilled that perfectly. Jesus has, and he, he did it for me. And so in him, it's as if, well, actually, not as if, but literally, because I'm in Christ, I have fulfilled those two commands perfectly. And one day, I will fulfill those two perfectly. One day, the Bible teaches, so if I die today, my soul would leave my body, go be with Jesus, my sin would be left behind here. One day my soul will return and the body that y'all put in the ground will resurrect me in the likeness of Jesus' resurrection body, sinless for all eternity in the new heavens and new earth. 
And so live, one day you will fulfill the law. Amen. One day you will live perfectly righteous. But it's all because of Jesus. It's actually a body that's not your own. It's His. That you inherit. I mean, it's, it's these glorious realities. And the third thing, it, it, the law helps us to express our thankfulness. And to conform ourselves to the law as a rule for obedience. And so we pursue, listen, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that you can just live however you want to. But I am saying this, that as a Christian, you pursue perfect obedience to God while pleading the blood of Jesus and His righteousness alone. And so as I, I'm running the race of Christianity, beating myself black and blue to, to use Paul's language, to bring myself under in obedience to the Lord. I'm reminded, I'm reminded constantly that it is not my running that saves me. But it's the fact that Jesus has already, you think of John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. His actual winning the race already. He's already at the finish line of the race I'm running. He's already won it. And one day I will be at that finish line because he's already there. He, he's literally pulling me towards him. But I, I'm still running <laughs> and falling short. But you know what? I will get there one day. But it's because of him. And so friends, I want to encourage you. Pursue perfect obedience to the, to the law. Pursue holiness. While realizing it is only Christ's holiness that saves you. So when you fall short, be thankful that Christ has it and you're in Him. And get up and live for Jesus. And when you fall down again, be thankful that He saved you. Get up and live for Jesus. Because you're going to keep falling. You're going to keep tripping. But it's only by His righteousness. And be thankful that He's been provided. As Brother Kenny comes and leads us into Him's invitation, let's all stand and respond to how God may be living on. I invite you to come and listen. You can enjoy the grace that I enjoy. You can enjoy the perfect obedience of Christ credited into your account. You can be saved. But you must repent and believe. You must turn from the mirror. Friend, I realize that this, this may be difficult. It, it means you've got to admit that your good works are not good enough. But the reality is you know they're not good enough. I know they're not good enough. I know mine are. I need Jesus and His grace has been provided. I want to encourage you to come and join the forgiveness of your sins and the righteousness of Christ credited to you. Oh, Lord, Lord, Lord,
Father God, we thank you so much that you love us enough to one side of the key to covenant with us. Something we don't deserve.